You know, uh, several weeks ago, Sarah and I were watching the Andy Griffith show. <coughs> and uh, this episode, they had a, a visiting preacher. And he's up there giving this sermon, and he's just droning on and on. And old Gomer's back out there. He's snoring, and Barney's eyes are rolling in the back of his head, and Andy's staring wide-eyed, trying to keep from falling asleep. And it cuts to him at, out in front of the, the church, and everybody's filing by, and he, he's out there talking. They're talking to the preacher, and they're trying to compliment him. But none of them could remember what the sermon was about. They're going, yeah, I really enjoyed that, and then it did kind of fade away. And finally, old Barney, he goes, yep, I really enjoyed that sermon. You know, we just can't talk enough about sin. So if you come up to me after the, and tell me that you enjoyed my sermon on sin, I'll know where you're coming from. <laughs> about two or three years ago, I can't remember, I teaching in my class, and I made a comment about demons. And uh, like I normally do, I went home and instantly forgot about that. Sean Quintanilla didn't, though. She remembered that I told her that I would teach a class on demons someday. Well, this fall, she reminded me. So I said, well, let me finish this study on the feast, and then I'll do that. And I was going to try to make it a one day, just a one Sunday class. And uh, when I got, got into it and started pulling my notes out, I realized that I really couldn't talk about demons without first talking about Satan. And to talk about Satan, you need to talk about angels. So I did a class on Satan and his angels and, and angels and the power of angels. And, and when I was doing that study, it affected me in, in several ways that I'll get to later, but I thought, you know, maybe it'd be good to share this with the congregation. Maybe it will help them the way it's helped me. So that's where this sermon came from. The, that's the genesis of it. <clears throat> now this, this study, not everybody will agree with. There will be differences of opinion. So everything I say, I intend to back up with Scripture. Now, I'm, I'm not going to have time to read every Scripture. But I will tell you where that, that point comes from, which verses. And you can get you one of them little cards and write it down on the back if you want to, but it won't fit on there. You might have to get five or six. Or I can uh, have a guy put it on the website and you can just... Get it off of there. So, again, there's, I'm going to have to read some of this because I can't remember all those scriptures. One thing we need to know about angels is that angels aren't like people. Angels are lower than God, lower than deity, but they're higher than man. And you find that in Hebrews 2, 7. Also, angels were created to be angels. Colossians 1, 16. You know that, those... Uh, what was that? It's a wonderful life where Clarence is trying to get his wings. That's not real. I hope you all understand that. That's not real. People don't become angels. Angels were created angels. Um, angels are not God. They can't do what God does. They're not omnipotent. God is omnipotent. He can do anything. Jeremiah thirty-two twenty-seven. Angels were created and do not have the power to create. Colossians, again, Colossians 1.16. All things were created through Christ, Father, and the Spirit. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. Psalm 139. Angels are limited. They have to travel. Gabriel left heaven to go to speak to uh, Zechariah in the temple. Luke 1.19. Angels can be delayed. Daniel 10. Daniel was praying, and he, an angel came to him and told him, I've been delayed by the, by the prince of Persia, which is one of Satan's angels. And uh, Michael had to come and rescue him. Michael and his army had to come and rescue him against the prince of Persia and his army. So they can be delayed. They have to travel, 
and they, they, they can't be delayed. They can't be in, one, in more than one place. God is omnificent. God knows everything. 1 John 3.20. Angels don't know prophecies. 1 Peter 1.12. And they don't know when the world will end, but God does. Matthew 24.36. Angels aren't equal to God, and worshiping them is a sin. Colossians 2.17.19. What do angels look like? Satan appeared to Eve as a serpent, Genesis 3. Angels appeared to Abraham and Lot as men, Genesis 18 and 19. Angels appeared to Moses as flames in a, in a burning bush, Acts 7.30. Angels can appear as wind or, or flames, Hebrews 1.7. Angels can appear as horses and chariots of fire, 2 Kings 2.11 and 2 Kings 6.17. Angels can be in, invisible until they decide to reveal themselves to humans. Numbers 22, 21 through 34. And angels can be terrifying in appearance. Daniel, again, Daniel 10, 7 through 11. Angels can communicate to us through our thoughts. An angel spoke to Jacob in a dream, Genesis 3, 11. An angel spoke three times to Joseph in Matthew 1, 20, 2, 13, and 2, 19. That's what angels do. That's what angels are. Satan's an angel. Here's why I believe that. Where did Satan come from? Ezekiel 28, 12 through 17. That was just read to you, so I'm not going to read it again. But what you can know from that, the king of Tyre was not in the Garden of Eden. He wasn't created. He was procreated. He can't be a garden cherub. You know, when we talk about cherubs, a lot of times people think of the little... Bow and arrow and Valentine's Day cherub. That's exactly the opposite of what a cherub is. He's a mighty angel. His existence began on earth, so he could not be expelled from heaven. I'm talking about what the Bible, the king of Tyre. He could be, this, it could be symbolic language, but only if it symbolizes something that took place in the Garden of Eden. His pride caused his fall. Ezekiel 28 and 1 Timothy 3.6. And it's clear that this happened in the garden. Whatever happened in his garden caused him to fall. He was cast down the same time as man, Genesis 3, 14 through 19. And it was at the same time that his rebellious angels followed him, 2 Peter 2, 4, and Jude 6. Here's where it gets serious. Satan rules the world. He's no longer in heaven. He was cast down. So where is he? He's on earth. God owns the world, Psalm 24, 1, but Satan controls it, 1 John 5, 19. Jesus called him the prince of the world, John 14, 30. There's something you need to know, too, is that there are three heavens, 2 Corinthians 12, 2. There's the atmosphere, James 5, 18, outer space, 2 Peter 3.10, and the heaven where God resides, 1 Peter 3.21-22. How does this apply to our spiritual warfare? Ephesians 6.12 speaks of evil, of forces of evil in heavenly realms. Well, we know they can't be with God in, in heaven, so where do they have to be? One of those other heavens. Satan is the ruler of the air, Ephesians 2.2. 2. I just, for me, it's easier just to think of where can, wherever man can go, Satan can go. If man can't go there not until he dies, then Satan's not going to go there. Satan controls the world, but Jesus will rule. All authority on earth has been given to Jesus, Matthew 28, 18. God has put everything under his feet, Hebrews 2, 8. Jesus has all authority, but everyone is subjected to him. But not everyone, excuse me, not everyone is subjected to him. Now that... That might be a little confusing to you. How can Jesus control the world, but all, I mean, how can Satan control the world, but all authority is given to Jesus? Well, if you've ever had a two-year-old child, you can understand that. You've got authority, but you're not controlling them. <laughs> That's the way we are sometimes, aren't we? We're like that two-year-old child. God has, a, Jesus has authority over us, but sometimes a Satan has control of us. How does Satan, what is some of Satan's power? 
Well, he incited David to take a census, 1 Corinthians 21.1. He kept a woman bound for 18 years, Luke 13.16. He asked to sift Simon as wheat, Luke 22.31. He prompted Judas to betray Jesus, John 13.2. He entered Judas, John 13.27. He filled Ananias' heart, Acts 5.3. Listen to this. He blinds the minds of, minds of believers. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He's at work in the disobedient, Ephesians 2.2. 2. He takes them captive to do his will, 2 Timothy 2.26. Satan has power, but he's not all-powerful. Satan manipulates, really, rather than controls. The only people that were ever controlled against their will were people that were possessed by demons. And that's a whole other subject. Christians aren't immune to Satan's power. Remember the words of Paul. If you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. If Satan's powerless, how did he prompt Judas to betray Jesus or incite David to number Israel? or sift Peter, or deny Jesus, to not deny Jesus. In each one of these cases, the person responsible stands before God, but it's very clear who the instigator is. We are responsible for our actions. Satan may prompt us, he may incite us, but we always have the choice to not do that. God also says that he won't tempt us. We, he won't allow us to be tempted by what we, beyond our, our, our means. If Satan's powerless, how did he prompt, uh, prompt Judas? I just did that, didn't I? Satan isn't God. He's not omnipotent. He couldn't attack Peter, Job or Peter without permission. He couldn't, he couldn't force his way back into heaven. And when he would attack Jesus of birth, he was defeated by Michael. That's uh, Revelations 12. He is an omnipresent and he is an omniscient. You know, it's interesting if you want to think about how, put it in light of how Satan can work, when that Satan uh, being defeated by Michael at Jesus' birth. Well, how did that happen? That's, that's past. That's not future. That's past. How did that happen? Well, we know how that happens. The Bible tells us how that happens, didn't it? When, he, when Satan attacked Jesus, what did he do? He prompted Herod to kill all the two-year-old male sons, our children, in the area of Bethlehem. How did Michael defeat him? He told Joseph to take Jesus and get out of there, go to Egypt. So you see, Revelations tells us that was a battle between angels. We see it as just something that happened, don't we? <clears throat> don't slander Satan. God warns us in 2 Peter 2. You ought to write this down. 2 Peter 2, 10 and 12, and Jude 8 through 10. Very strong language in there about people that slander Satan. Now, you may think, how do we slander Satan today? Well, I don't know every way we could slander Satan, but I can tell you this. Don't take him lightly. Don't make him the, the brud of a joke. Don't make him a cute little verse in a song for kids. You're teaching your kids about Satan sitting on attack. Satan's a very scary creature. Don't teach your kids that. Don't teach them from the very start that Satan's a joke. He's a funny thing. While I'm on my soapbox, Noah and his ark, What's with that? We'd stick a giraffe with a big grin on his face and an elephant smiling, sticking their heads out of the ark. The ark was judgment, people. The ark was a symbol of judgment. That would be like putting a smiley faces on everybody in a lifeboat in the Titanic. Less than 2,000 people died there. I'm sure it was millions of people that died when the flood came, we need to think about what we're teaching our children. 
sometimes we don't, we want to protect them. And we teach them these little things to make it not so scary. I don't believe we should do that. I believe they need to know that the Bible is real. The Bible is true. Satan's a scary thing. Sin is scary. So that when they go to church, I mean, when they go to school and they hear these things, they can, they can know that, that what's at church is not little nursery rhymes and we've got to go to school and hear facts. Let's teach them from the very beginning. Tools Satan use. Let's look at the story of Job. And I understand Job was a righteous and upright man. Would God say that about you? I hope he would. But we know he said that about Job. And look what happened to him. Satan used wicked people to steal Job's camels and kill his servants. He used wind to kill his children. He used lightning to kill his sheep and his other servants. Satan used sickness. Satan used good people. To discourage him. You know those friends that were talking to him and telling him he'd done wrong. You, you know they loved Job. They sat there for seven days before they would even speak. They were hurting so much. They thought they were giving him good advice. You know, I, I always read about when I always read what uh, Job's wife said, I always, I always just pictured that in my mind as some nagging old lady, you know, telling him to curse God and die. But, you know, if you step back and look at that, and I don't know how the language tra was translated, but you think about the, what was happening in those days. She had just lost all of her sons. Her husband had lost all of his wealth, and she's telling him to die. What, what was she going to gain there? She was going to fix him to be a woman without nothing, anything. Not even a means to support herself. Maybe, just maybe, she was really saying, I don't want to see you suffer anymore. Have you ever heard a, a, a wife tell a husband to let go? Because he's in pain? Don't know. Maybe that's what she was saying, though. But the point is that Job, I mean, Satan used good people who loved Job to discourage him. Satan didn't use any miracles. You notice that? None of that was a miracle. Everything tool that Satan used, natural, everyday things, wasn't it? You know, when we, when we talk, read stories about angels, we like to think of some guy, that hitchhiker, they got picked up on a rainy day, and they drove him, and he saved them somehow, and they wouldn't have driven off this bridge if he hadn't have gotten in the car, and then they'd drop him off, and they'd look in the rearview mirror, and he's gone, not there. You know, we, we talk about those kind of stories, but that's not always the way angels work. Angels can work through a friend, Have you, ever had, have you ever felt the need to call somebody? I suggest you do it. Have you ever been down when somebody called you or came and visited you? Just at the right time. Maybe that wasn't coincidence. Maybe that was an angel that prompted that person to do that. I'll tell you a story for me personally. Back in 1990, I started a consulting business. At the very beginning, it, money wasn't rolling in. And while I was praying about that, while I was praying, the phone rang with a job that set me up for the rest of the year. Now, you might think, well, that was, just, that was already in progress before you even started praying. That wasn't an angel. Maybe, maybe so. But read about Abraham's servant going to, to see Rebecca and see what happened there. An angel had already sent her on her way before the servant even started praying. He looked up and she was coming. So there's, there's angels work in a lot of ways. And we can, we can be one of those tools if we'll let ourselves. 
Satan can know our thoughts. Like I said, he spoke to Joseph in a dream without using any of the five senses the angel communicated to Joseph. Well, if they can communicate to us in our thoughts, wouldn't it be logical that they can know our thoughts? So it shouldn't be any surprise to us that he knows just the right time and just the right way to tempt us. But God doesn't tempt us. James 1.13 tells us that God doesn't tempt us. Satan does. You know, Matthew 6.13, we read about what's called the Lord's Prayer. And what do we ask God to do? To lead it, not lead us into temptation? Well, God doesn't tempt us, so why are we praying that? Why did Jesus tell that? Tell us that. But he also tied the two together, didn't he? Temptation and Satan. Maybe what he's saying is, lead us away from temptation by delivering us from Satan. Angels can sometimes interfere with our answers to our prayers. Remember what I, when I talked about Daniel, being, the angel being delayed. Daniel was praying. The angel was delayed. He had to be rescued to get to Daniel, to answer his prayer. But Daniel kept praying during that time. Now, God can answer a short prayer. Surely, we know that. And I don't think God thinks that there's a specific number of times that we have to ask a prayer before it's going to be answered. But Luke 11, 5 and 8 and 18, 1 through 8 tells us that we should keep praying. Maybe that's what praying without ceasing, ceasing means. Maybe it doesn't mean that we pray constantly because it really, if you think about that, it's really kind of impossible. Maybe what it means is when you start praying about something, don't give up. Don't stop. John Nash and Sue, they have a group that meets here every Sunday and they pray for the lost and they've been doing it for years now, right? Years. They haven't given up. That's what it means. Keep praying. Keep praying until it's impossible to be filled. Maybe, maybe God's answer is that this person dies or you, your sickness doesn't go away. But in the meantime, keep praying. Don't lose heart. There's a battle going on. Maybe your prayers help. Maybe, maybe they help in that battle. Okay, why study Satan? Well, Paul tells us to be aware of Satan and his schemes. 2 Corinthians 2.11 Put on the armor of God to scan, stand against the devil and his schemes. 6.11, Paul tells us to be aware of Satan's schemes and how to stand against them. We, we, we have to know the way Satan works to know how to deal with him, how to, how to answer those things, how to respond, how to react. I want to put this in context by, by, by me, how this, how this affected me. Even though Satan is an all-powerful, he's far more powerful than me. Even though Satan doesn't know everything, he knows a lot more than I do. Satan can't be everywhere. The odds are he doesn't even know me. Now, it may surprise some of you, but... He probably doesn't even know who I am. But he has an army of angels, and I'm positive that at least one of them knows me, and he knows my thoughts. What does that mean? What it means to me, sometimes Satan's going to win. Sometimes I'm going to have that armor on, and I'm not going to stand. And Satan wins one. Doesn't mean the battle's over. Or the war's over, but he got one. So I shouldn't beat myself up over that. God doesn't want us to feel guilty, does he? It gives me peace to know that. To know that my battle is not against others, my battle's with Satan. 
You know, Ephesians, he says that our, Paul says our battle is not with flesh and blood. In the past, I always looked at that. Mean, that means I, my battle wasn't with other people. But now I've come to believe that I'm also flesh and blood. And my battle's not with me either. I'm weak, especially compared to the angels. So I can be at peace at that, about that. I can know that sometimes Satan's going to win, sometimes he's going to beat me, but I can get right back up and go on. Second, I know that Satan can use e evil people. He did against Job. I think that's easier to spot. I think we're pretty good at spotting evil people. And we can know, okay, Satan's probably using that person. But remember what I said about him using good people? Well, we need to be aware of that too. Sometimes people can give us bad advice. It may be well-meaning, but it can be wrong. But more important is don't be that person. Don't be that person giving that bad advice. You don't know what God thinks. Don't act like you do. You know, three friends came and talked to Job, and they said, Job, you've done something wrong. All three of them. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Job, you've done something wrong. But, you know, there was a fourth friend, Elihu, who comes along, and when you read what he says, you go, okay, that sounds right. He told Job, you know, he, he praised God, talked about how great God was. He said that, Job, you didn't do anything wrong. You know what he told him? See if you've ever done this. He told Job, God's preparing you. See, he presumed to know what God was thinking, just like the other three. Have you ever told somebody that the reason something bad happened to you was because God was preparing you for something else? Well, if you have, you're no different than Elihu. You know, telling somebody that you know why a loved one died when you don't, because you don't, it's no different. When you tell somebody why something bad happened to them, it's no different. You don't know the thoughts of God. If you learn one thing from the book of Job is that you do not speak for God. If you want to speak, if you want to give advice, you take it from the Bible. You read in the scripture. That's the only thing you should do. When you presume to put your place in the place of God, better be careful. Better be careful. Okay, it's time for me to make a confession. This is the hard part. I reached a point in my life where, for various reasons, I've become discouraged. Uh, guilt and self-doubt was consuming me. Like I said, there's many reasons, but, you know, I've been an elder for almost 14 years, maybe more than four. How long have we been elders, Cliff? Over 14 years. Since I've been an elder, the attendance at, Water Ro at Waters Road has, average attendance has dropped by close to 120. Our budget giving has dropped so much so that for the first time in the 40 years that I've been here, we've had to cut our giving to mission work. When I first came to Waters Road 40 years ago, 
we would have from the general population now a man come up and do an opening prayer. Another man would come up and pray for the sick. A third man would come up and read Scripture. When we did the Lord's Supper, three men at that table, three different men at that table would lead a prayer for the Lord's Supper. And then the seventh man would get up and lead a closing prayer. Gene, you've been here. That's the way it was, wasn't it? Seven men got up and led. And why am I telling you this? Because I believe that everyone should have a ministry. And when I became an elder, I said my ministry was to help the leadership of the men in this church. I believe that if the men in this church would be leaders, that Waters Road would grow. That we would be the congregation God wants us to be. Well, guess what? We have three men now that participate in the Lord in the worship service. Not counting the song leaders and the elders that give up, get up and do the closing prayer and pray for the sick. We have three men, three out of seven. You know, we have a guy get up here and lead the prayer, so the guys that come up and, and sit in the pews to lead the service won't have to do that so that they can get the people to be up here. We have men that will hide in the restroom. That's what the guys in the back have told me. They'll stay out of here to keep from having to wait on the Lord's table. All you got to do is pass trays. So you tell me, where have I... Where's my successes? What have I done as an elder that's made things better? Back in March, I sat down and wrote a letter of resignation. I folded it up, stuck it in an envelope, and put it to my Bible, and that Wednesday night I went to church. I mean, went to the elders meeting with that letter in my Bible. I don't know how well you know me, but I hate to quit. I hate to be a quitter. It's just a, a bad taste in my mouth. I, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Last August, I, the self-doubt and guilt just consumed me again. I pulled that letter out and I changed the date, and stuck it back in my Bible and came to the elders meeting. I couldn't do it again. January the 10th, I pulled the letter out, and this time I just scratched the date out, wrote in the date, and I handed it in. I handed in my letter. They would have. They wouldn't let me. <sighs> Cliff's been like a bulldog. He got me by the pants leg and I can't get away. <laughs> so they asked me to take my letter back, and let's pray about it for a week. That was January the 10th. I said, no, I'm not going to take my letter back, but I'll pray about it. And then something happened that very Sunday, something very innocent, very insignificant, but it told me it's time for me to go. Charles, I don't know if y'all remember this, but Charles did something completely out of character. Not blaming Charles. It had nothing to do with that other than that, you know, Charles has been sick. He, he's been trying to do two jobs. He forgot and told us to sit down after the opening, opening uh, song. Remember that? And I, just like about everybody else in this congregation, sat down. 
And as soon as I hit that seat, it dawned on me. I'm religious. I don't stand or sit for the reading of God's word out of respect. I do it because somebody told me to. I don't stand or sit to rejoice to God in song. I do it because somebody tells me to. That's religious. That's custom. That's not desire. I'm doing something because that's the tradition. That's the custom. But that wasn't the worst part. Remember when I said just about everybody sat down? My wife didn't. And I was ashamed, people. I was ashamed because she had the conviction of her faith and I didn't. I wasn't even being the the leader in my home the Christian leader in my own home. How could I be a leader at Waters Road when I can't even lead my wife? She has to lead me. I stood up. In a minute, we're going to have an invitation song. And I'm going to ask Charles, Charles, Cliff, you are Cliff, right? I want to ask Cliff to come and pray for me. I can't come forward because I'm already forward. But maybe you're like me. Maybe you've been discouraged and you're filled with self-doubt. Well, you can come down and Cliff will pray for you too. Or maybe you're like me and you've let Satan use you to discourage others. Well, come on down. Or maybe Satan has used whatever tool to keep you from teaching the gospel. You know, in 2017, I did not teach the gospel to one person. Not one. That's pathetic. If I'm a disciple of Christ and I'm to make disciples, doesn't it stand to reason that I would want to do that? But I didn't. Maybe you're like me and you haven't been a Christian leader in your home. Men. Or maybe, like me, you haven't been a Christian leader in the church. Well, maybe today's the day that you want to decide to finally stand in the gap for your family and for your your church family. Well, if you do, come on down. Cliff will pray for you for that, too. You know, God created man to stand in the mouth of the cave and protect He created women to be in the back and nurture. Ladies, maybe you're exhausted from trying to stand in the mouth of the cave and protect and be in the back nurturing. Maybe there's not a man to lead you or the one you have isn't leading you and you're wore out from trying to do that. Cliff, you'll pray for them too, won't you? Or maybe you're not even in the fight. Maybe you haven't put on that armor of God. Do you all know that the armor of God is Jesus Christ? Every one of those names of that piece of, those pieces of armor, they're Christ. So if you want to put on that armor today, if you want to put on Christ, come down here. We'll help you. But right now, Satan has the advantage over you. He has the advantage because all he has to do right now is keep you in that seat. So what I'm going to do, not out of tradition, but to help you overcome that inertia, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up.
Now, you need to know something. There's fixing to be a battle in heaven. It's going to start right now. And you know what it's over? That battle's over one step. One step, people. All you have to do is make one step. Because I guarantee if you make that one step, the second and the third and the fourth one, or however long it takes you to get here, gets easier and easier. All he has to do is keep you from taking one step. So Cliff, Brad, come up here. Let's offer the invitation.